Okay, well, with that, I think it's time to start. So uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we go ahead and give this a try? So uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Jonas Sonner. I'm with WGR Southwest and this is Stormwater Awareness Week 2020. Um, and we've been having a great week of classes. Uh, we've had over uh, 800 participants in our classes so far and it's only Thursday. So I'm sure we're going to keep getting uh, more people joining and we still got a whole nother uh, day of classes. So um, yeah, this has been a great week. Uh, and as I said, I am with uh, WGR Southwest. And uh, today's topic, we're gonna be covering um, some of the MS4 permits uh, uh, required staff training. So I'm gonna be covering uh, illicit discharge uh, detection and elimination. I'm gonna be covering some pollution prevention topics, good housekeeping, and uh, also trying to throw in a couple of quiz questions for us. So um, with that, uh, let's just give a quick overview of, uh, of where we're at. So um, if you're not familiar with this, we are under what's called the phase two MS4 permit. Um, and there's, there's two municipal permits that are issued by the state water board. Uh, there's a phase one permit, which focuses on large municipalities. You think of Sacramento or uh, San Francisco. And these, uh, these permits are uh, region specific. They are uh, uh, city specific and regional board specific. So they're written for a certain area. The phase two permit is a general permit. And uh, it, it was issued in 2013, it became effective July 1st, 2013 replaced the previous permit from 2003. Um, and uh, it built upon a lot of the elements that were established from that permit back in 2003. It had a five year term that expired. So the current permit we're under is expired now. It expired in 2018. But the order has been administratively extended until the next permit is ready to be issued. Um, the permit years follow the fiscal year. They are July 1st to June 30th. Um, and the program was phased in over a five year term. What that means is instead of having a permit and all the requirements need to be implemented at one sitting, um, the board opted to uh, uh, select certain requirements to be implemented during certain permit years. So year one had its tasks, year two had its tasks and so on and so forth. So since we have gone through the five year term, there aren't any new tasks to be implemented. Um, and it's just uh, to be continued to be implemented as it's uh, been established. A new permit is in the works um, and it's coming closer to being issued. The, the more uh, recent conversations we've had with the water board, um, they're saying we can, expect, uh, we can expect it maybe to be issued in fall of 2021, maybe winter of 2021, but that's really dependent on a lot of the uh, uh, processes going smoothly and there aren't a lot of comments or a lot of revisions that are required. So we can expect that soon, but it is, it is still coming. Um, so why are we doing this training? Why are we here today? Well, from that phase two permit that we're under, out of the many requirements that come from that, uh, that permit requires municipalities to annually assess staff's knowledge of illicit discharge response and provide refresher training as needed. It also requires that municipalities um, establish a biennial or every two year uh, employee training program for staff involved with pollution prevention and good housekeeping practices. And both of those programs require uh, uh, the following list. You need a general stormwater education component um, operational changes to their specific job or facility, um, BMP guidance, again the biennial assessment of staff's trained knowledge uh, for pollution prevention and good housekeeping techniques, and uh, also ensuring contractors that perform O&M activities are contractually obligated to comply with all stormwater BMPs. Now um, while I can't speak to each of your municipalities uh, specific operational changes, I can provide a general stormwater education component and BMP guidance. So um, hopefully you can use this as part of that uh, refresher training and uh, that you'll find this useful for your staff. So with that, 
Um, as I said, I'm going to be breaking this up into about three sections. We're going to have a stormwater 101 component. We're going to talk about illicit discharges and eliminating them. And then we're going to close with pollution prevention and good housekeeping techniques. Um, and also, uh, I will try to fit in some quiz questions uh, throughout the presentation. Don't worry, these aren't brain ticklers. Uh, they should be pretty easy to get. And um, I didn't have time to prepare the questions in Zoom. So if you would, just uh, put in the corresponding letter for each answer that you want to give in the chat. And, uh, um, and we'll, we'll try it that way. And my friend or coworker Danny is going to be uh, keeping track of all of those uh, of all of those answers that we get in. So with that, let's get into stormwater 101 and our first quiz question. So what is an illicit discharge? That's our first question. Hopefully this should be fairly easy. Um, is it A, a stormwater discharge? B, discharges from potable water sources? C, residential car washing discharges? Or D, non-stormwater discharges? Um, if you would, put your answer in the chat now. Do you think it's A, B, C, or D? Go ahead and put your answers in. Won't spend too much time. See some answers coming in. Good. We'll keep going with that. Yeah, you guys are you guys have got it. It is answer D. It is non-stormwater discharges, and we'll define that a little bit. That um, that uh, could have some potential. Uh, 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 exceptions. So we'll get into some of the specifics for illicit discharges in a little bit. Um, but here's another question I'm going to throw at you guys. Oh, wait, nope. Sorry, my computer just froze. All right. Uh, so let's, let's cover some of the basics of stormwater. Um, what is stormwater? Well, stormwater, this should be pretty simple for everybody. It's water that comes from precipitation, ice and snow melt. Um, and uh, that stormwater is dispersed uh, after a precipitation event by soaking into the soil, by ponding and evaporating, or most commonly in urban settings, running off to another location, um, stormwater runoff. Now, normally that's not an issue because it should be clean water unless we're having acid rain. Um, but that stormwater runoff can pick up many harmful pollutants as it is uh, running off to other locations and ultimately receiving waters. And in fact, urban stormwater is listed as a primary source of impairment for many rivers, lakes, and reservoirs in California. So as stormwater runs off in these uh, highly urbanized areas, it has a high potential to pick up pollutants and it's conveyed to uh, receiving waters, which will impact them adversely taking all these pollutants to receiving waters. So here's another quiz question, talking about the conveyance system and how stormwater gets from point A to point B, which of these would not be considered part of the MS4 conveyance system? Which of these would not be considered a part of the MS4 conveyance system? A, a park basin, B, streets and sidewalks, C, catch basins, D, none of the above. Put your answers in the chat. Think about it for a little bit. A, park basin. B, streets and sidewalks. C, catch basins. D, none of the above. What do you guys think? See some answers coming in. Some votes for answer D. A. Got to say, this is weird when there's there's no audience to or a class of people in front of you. Doesn't feel like you're getting a response. Okay, we got some answers here. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of a trick question. Um, the answer, it I would say, is none of the above. Park basins can be considered part of the conveyance system, and we'll get into a little bit of that uh, terminology in this next slide. Um, but it does have the potential to uh, be retained in a basin and then ultimately discharged either into the ground or into a receiving water. So it could be considered part of the conveyance system in some instances. 
So what is that conveyance system? Well, uh, a legal definition or a technical definition is a system that stormwater is routed through, which will ultimately discharge into the waters of the United States or receiving water body, and it must be operated by a public agency. So you can imagine that can include a lot of different things. It can include streets, it can include catch basins, curbs and gutters, ditches and man-made channels, sometimes retention basins and storm drains, obviously. Here's some examples of those. You have basins holding water, you have channels conveying water, uh, looks like a swale or more of another retention basin and then storm drain inlets, obviously. So there's a couple other of definitions here that I've probably mentioned already. Um, talked about discharges a little bit. Uh, what is a discharge? Well, a discharge is runoff that leaves a property, a facility, or a specific job site and enters the MS4 conveyance system. So this could be, um, say you're on an O&M activity and uh, you wash something off into the street uh, and that enters into the street and then the curb and gutter into a storm drain, well that enters the conveyance system and that would be a discharge. Um, there's also another term uh, that is kind of interchangeably used with a few other things. It's called a direct discharge, which is a discharge that is routed directly to a receiving water through a pipe channel or ditch, and it doesn't have any other connections with it. Um, so we don't see a lot of this in the, uh, in the valley, but in the Bay Area, they have a lot of direct discharges to uh, receiving waters. Um, an outfall is similar to a discharge. The definitions get kind of muddied and uh, are different between who you ask. But this is a point, a point source where an MS4 system discharges to a water body or receiving water with no other conveyance means. Um, so it's just the ultimate uh, uh, point where the discharge is going to leave um, and enter a receiving water. That's called an outfall. It can also be the final point where runoff leaves a specific facility or a job site can also be considered an outfall, although some people don't like considering that. Some people will call that a discharge point or final point of discharge. Um, as we talked about before, non-storm water, again, it's pretty obvious what this is. It's any discharge to the conveyance system that is not entirely comprised of storm water. However, there are two categories, allowable and illicit stormwater discharges. Um, we'll dis discuss that a little bit later. Um, but uh, if we have uh, pollutants in our runoff, if we have pollutants that we're trying to prevent or filter or whatever, how do we how do we protect stormwater or how do we uh, yeah how do we protect stormwater from pollution? Well, we implement BMPs or best management practices, which are just practices or combination of practices that have been proven effective and practicable to prevent or reduce the amount of pollution. Um, and these can be structural or procedural. Structural or non-structural are the two categories. I like to think of it as more of a uh, procedural. Um, and uh, we'll get into BMPs a little bit later. Those are just the terminology that I'm gonna be using in case you're unfamiliar with that. So with that, let's get to another question. Talking about stormwater or uh, non-stormwater again, which of these is not considered an allowable non-stormwater discharge? This should be a fairly easy one. A, chlorinated pool water. B, discharges from emergency fire response. C, landscape irrigation. D, air conditioner condensate. Which of these do you think is not an allowable non-stormwater discharge? Put your answer in the chat. See some answers coming through already. A lot of people voting for A, and I didn't, I wasn't able to trick you. You're right, it's A. Now what is allowed uh, is dechlorinated pool water but chlorinated pool water is obviously not allowed. So, uh, similarly, um, uh, you need to dechlorinate uh, fire hydrant flushing. You can't allow something to be chlorinated and, and enter the storm, storm drain conveyance system. So another one here, which of these is not considered to be a common pollutant? Now there's no definition for this, but uh, this is kind of just from what you see from place to place. Uh, what do you think is not so much a common pollutant? Uh, sediment, trash, grass clippings, or pathogens? Put your answers in the chat. Got some votes for D. 
D. A lot of people vote in D here. Is it sediment, trash, grass clippings, or pathogens? A lot of people vote in D. I didn't, I didn't expect that, but um, uh, in, my, uh, in my experience, this might be controversial, um, my idea here was grass clippings because while that might be an issue in some areas due to receiving water impairment, um, sediment is a common pollutant for almost every municipality. Trash is a common pollutant for almost every municipality because of the trash implementation program you should be familiar with. Pathogens are a common concern because of, of uh, sanitary sewer overflows. That's always a, a factor. But grass clippings isn't always talked about. It's kind of more region specific. Now, obviously you don't want to let that in the storm drain, but it's more of what comes from landscaping like pesticides or fertilizers that are a bigger concern, not so much the grass clippings themselves. But put a pin in that, that's kind of a, I just wanted to make a point that it's not so necessarily the item, but it's kind of what's being applied during that. Um, so let's continue with some stormwater pollutants. So like I said, sediment and solids, you have construction sites um, are a big source of, of sediment leaving uh, an urban runoff. Um, trash, as I said before, uh, but I would like to make a note here that the board's definition of trash is a little bit funny to me. To be considered a stormwater pollutant, uh, it needs to be able to, to be uh, small enough to fit into the conveyance system. So if it can't go down the storm drain, it's not technically a stormwater pollutant. However, it can still have certain pollutants uh, along with it, um, and you can have, you know, maybe a, somebody trashed or, or illegally dumped uh, oil containers on the side of the road. Um, well, that pollutant would obviously be oil and grease. The oil cans themselves might not fit into the storm drain, but definitely the product they're containing can. As I said, pathogens and bacteria from sanitary sewer overflows is a concern. Um, and along with that, you'll have fats, oils, and grease uh, as it clogs uh, as it clogs uh, lines and can cause overflows. Um, pesticides and nitrates, fertilizers from, uh, from landscaping activities, as well as pH altering substances from industrial commercial and sometimes construction as well. So with that, that should wrap up our stormwater 101. And let's get into illicit discharge detection and elimination. <clears throat> so, as we, as we stated before, an illicit discharge is a non-stormwater discharge. It's basically any discharge materials other than clean stormwater to the MS4 conveyance system with an asterisk because there is a list of allowable discharges. Um, and you can find this list most commonly in your municipal ordinances, although it should be available in a few other places. And here is a sample of that list from a municipal ordinance. As you can see here, incidental runoff from landscape areas, waterline flushing, rising groundwater, uh, natural flows, dechlorinated swimming pools. Um, and it, it goes on, there's about 15 different uh, categories here. But the thing they all have in common with maybe exception of the uh, car washing, natural disaster flooding or uh, emergency firefighting uh, water, um, they all have to be clean or they all have to be reasonably believed to be clean or not cause a significant contribution of pollutants. Now, the reason that there's an asterisk here is because if any of these discharges convey pollutants, if they pick it up along the way, they're no longer considered an allowable discharge and now an illicit discharge, not necessarily from what they originally or originated from, but it's what they picked up along the way. So say if they were, de uh, you know, dumping pool water that's been dechlorinated and it's safe, but there's a big pile of dirt in the gutter and then it takes it down into the storm drain, that's now an illicit discharge. Um, so what are some sources and signs of illicit discharges? Well, the most common uh, way to identify illicit discharges is during dry weather flows or, or finding a dry weather flow. Um, and this can be either in the storm drain itself from a facility or at a, a, an outfall, the final point of discharge from your municipality. Um, 
and they can they can happen any time, any place. Um, and uh, another uh, source of illicit discharges can be sanitary sewer overflows, as we said, um, from clogs or leaks. Um, and uh, the last one is um, from industrial or commercial facilities from doing like illicit washing or uh, maybe they had water line breaks, uh, something similar to that. So there's a few different sources here, um, but the primary one is uh, seeing flow in the storm drain when it is uh, supposed to be dry. Oops, I skipped ahead here, sorry. Uh, so what are some common discharge flow types? Well, like I said, you have the sewage and septic flows from uh, broken pipes. You'll have wash water flows from a variety of activities. It could be homeowners, it could be commercial facilities, it could be fleet washing, um, it could be illicit connections to the storm drain system through floor drains from old buildings. They could have a lot of sources. Um, you could have liquid wastes. Uh, you know, what happens if a, if a, excuse me, if a truck tanker falls over and starts spilling uh, gasoline um, into the street, well, that would be a, a liquid waste flow. It could be oil, paint, process water, um, anything other than, or any liquid entering the storm drain system could consider that. And then also tap water flows, um, leaks or losses from uh, the drinking water supply into the, into the storm drain system. That one is less common. I haven't seen that happen as much, um, but definitely those other three are, are very common for most municipalities. So there are a couple of, of uh, key indicators that we can look to to determine if a discharge is illicit because it could be an allowable discharge. So how do you identify that? Well, primarily through, uh, or firstly through physical indicators. And there's a whole list of them here. You have color, uh, you'll have odors as well, um, turbidity, sheens, uh, floatables, uh, abnormal growth, staining or damage of outfall or storm drains. Um, and these should be pretty, pretty obvious. So if your water is brown and it has floatable material in it, it could be sanitary sewer overflow. If it smells bad, uh, it might be sanitary sewer overflow. Um, if it's muddy, if, it's, uh, if it has a sheen on it, it could be from a construction site. Um, if there's abnormal growth around an outfall structure or a storm drain inlet, maybe somebody is over fertilizing and it's running off into the storm drain. Um, or if there's corrosion or damage to a storm drain or a pipe or something, it could be acidic or, uh, or basic or um, corrosive uh, or hazardous potentially entering the storm drain. Um, so the physical indicators are going to be our first, uh, first way of looking for if it's illicit or allowable. Here's another question for you. This is a scenario here. So let's say John Doe is performing some storm drain stenciling. He's doing his job. And he notices his flow in one of the drain inlets that he's stenciling. And as he's checking it out, because it's the middle of summer, um, he notices that it smells like fermented grapes. So we're moving on to in our discussion to reporting and investigation. So the question here is, when should an investigation begin? Should it begin immediately? Uh, within 24 hours, within 72 hours, or eh, just forget about it, it's probably nothing. What do you guys think? When should, when should John Doe follow up and investigate on this suspicious flow? Immediately, within 24 hours, within 72 hours, or just forget about it? Ah, I got a lot more diverse answers here. I like it. I like it. Most people are saying to, to investigate it immediately, and I would agree with that. Um, uh, it's, it's probably good to get a head start on it and, and, and get, a head, uh, get to it as quickly as possible. But the investigation definition that we'll look at here, um, actually for this scenario, would probably be about 24 hours, but as soon as possible as a good, as a good rule of thumb. And definitely don't just forget about it. It's, it's a potential, uh, it's a potential for pollution. So when do we need to report immediately? Well, if it's a scenario that is an immediate threat to human health or adverse uh, effect on the environment, 
that needs to be immediately reported. The moment you find it, it needs to be reported to the local health department and corrected as soon as possible. Um, like that tanker truck scenario, like I mentioned earlier, if something like that happens and fuel is spilling on the ground or an ammonia truck uh, crashes, that needs to be reported immediately to the local health department uh, so that appropriate cleanup measures can be taken. But for other things, for other non-stormwater discharges that are um, either sanitary sewage or significantly contaminated, they need to be prioritized and investigated within 24 hours. So again, as soon as possible, immediately if you can do it, but the, but the, the length of time you have is 24 hours for that. So good answers. I liked the immediately. You guys are on top of your game here. I like that. Um, so after that, here's where the 72 hours comes in. Um, so after that initial investigation, um, that 24 hour investigation, all other sources of suspected illicit discharges need to be investigated within 72 hours, becoming aware of this. Now we'll have to, we'll be coming back to this a little bit later. So I want you to just keep this in your mind, the 72 hours of becoming aware, because that's a key phrase that isn't really easily determined. And the reason it isn't, we'll, we'll check out this chart here. Um, uh, so this is a, a flow chart that you can use to uh, help remember these, these steps. The first step here, do you know where the discharge is coming from? Um, so in that scenario, the, the scenario with John Doe, if he is in front of a winery and he's smelling fermented grapes, he's probably going to find the source of it by just turning around and looking at the facility that he's in front of. And if, it's, if it is from there, if it's confirmed, um, is it an allowable discharge? Uh, and if it's yes, then you just need to document it and, and that's it. But if it's not, then you need to begin that 72 hour investigative and corrective action process. Um, and if it's not a known source, then you need to perform what's called indicator monitoring. Um, and then from that, you'll be taking samples of the discharge. And if they are below an action level concentrate, uh, you will you'll just document it and then there's no further action. But if they're above, if it's causing uh, a break in an action level, um, then you will have to begin that investigative process again here. So this process here, these first four, that's your 24 hours. And then everything after that is the 72 hour response. And so when does that 72 hours come into play? Well, again, we'll look at that in just a second here. But before we get to that, let's look at our next quiz question. See if you guys remember this. Where can we find a list of allowable non-stormwater discharges? A, the phase two permit on the municipality's website, in the municipal ordinances, or D, all of the above. Where can you find a list of allowable non-stormwater discharges? Municipal phase two permit, municipality's website, municipal ordinances. Yeah, you guys are awake. Yeah, this is why I had this question here. I just want to make sure you guys are paying attention, but you are, so good job, everybody. Um, uh, yes, it is. it should be all of the above. Um, obviously, it's going to be in the phase two permit. Most likely, it'll be in the municipal ordinances, um, but it should also be included on the municipality's website so that uh, everybody can everybody can view it. Um, so hopefully it is all of the above, uh, but at a minimum, it should be in the ordinances and the phase two permit. So let's start talking about indicator monitoring. So we've got our 24 hour response um, and let's just hypothesize. We don't know the source of that. There's no winery around John Doe's storm drain. So he's going to take a sample of it. And uh, within that 24 hour period, he had to get his bottles and his equipment ready. He went back and took a sample of that discharge. And so what is he doing? Well, it's used to confirm that the discharge is illicit. Maybe the physical indicators aren't so apparent and uh, you need to have some more clues about their source or origin. So municipalities are required to perform indicator monitoring at any outfalls where flow or ponding of water is observed more than 72 hours after the last rain event. Um, so don't pay too much attention to that 72 hours there. That's just to do, that's just a benchmark of how dry does it need to be for it to be considered a dry weather flow. That's that 72 hours there, but that's different from the 72 hours we're talking about earlier. Um, 
it's good to know this, but just the, keep those two 72s separate in your mind. And again, the outfall here, it can be a storm drain inlet or it can be the municipal's outfall. Um, it should, indicator monitoring should be utilized, uh, only be utilized if the source of the non-storm water flow is unknown. Um, and so here's, a, uh, here's an indicator parameter table that we got from the permit. Um, so we'll have a, our four types of discharges here, sewage, wash water, tap water, and then liquid wastes. And then these are the parameters that we're gonna be testing with. It's gonna be ammonia, color, conductivity, detergents or surfactants, fluoride, hardness, pH, potassium, and turbidity. And you can find this table in the phase two permit. Um, if you want to look at it in length again, maybe review it. Um, and they'll have physical, uh, they'll have indicators. So if you hit one of these tests during your indicator monitorings, this is a likely source that you can go and pursue. Um, so let's say we get a hit for fluoride, but everything else comes back good. Well, it's probably tap water. It's probably municipal drinking line that is coming through, uh, coming through into the storm drain system. Or it hits ammonia it's probably sewage and you should have been wearing gloves. Or what if it's high in pH and high in turbidity? Well, it could be an industrial commercial uh, liquid waste. So this table is, is useful to detect illicit discharges, um, but often the sampling results will give us a better idea here as we're looking at on this table. Um, so Indicator monitoring can perform, be performed either in the field or by using a certified laboratory to perform parameter analysis. Um, all of the tests that I just listed, they can be performed in the field. There might be one that I'm just forgetting about that has to be sent to the lab, but some of these tests can only be performed in the field, such as pH. It needs to be sampled 15 minutes of taking the sample. You can't hold that for a couple of days and send it off to the lab and have them take it then it's going to be different than the sample you took in the field. So that uh, turbidity would be another one. Um, color could be easy to determine in the field and that might be one you wanna do. But uh, we have usually taken a hybrid approach. We've ta taken some samples in the field and taken some samples in the laboratory. And again, it all depends on how much equipment your municipality has, how much they're willing to invest in. Sometimes it's cheaper just to send stuff to the lab. And as I said before, the action level concentrates, here they are from the phase two permit, they're pretty high. If you're familiar with, with action levels at all, these are fairly high uh, uh, than uh, most other permits you'll see them in. Like the pH range, it's the highest of out of all the general permits. Turbidity for construction, it, the limit is 250, and for us it's 1,000. So these are pretty high benchmarks to, to surpass. So it has to be a pretty significant discharge to really pass any of these action levels. Um, but again, positive hits for this or something above normal, again, 1,000 NTUs, if you have anything above over 250, that is not allowed um, in, uh, <clears throat> in the construction general permit. So if you're having under 1,000, but above 250, that's probably a good benchmark that you should probably go look for a source of illicit discharge. Same with pH and all these other ones. Um, and as I said before, so if we're talking about sending some samples to the lab and taking some in the field, how do we define that 72 hours of following up on these uh, investigations? When does that benchmark start? Well, we had conversations with the water board and the aware, so becoming aware within 72 hours, that's defined as uh, essentially when the municipality will receive analysis back from the lab. Um, they also stated that the standard 10-day turnaround from the lab is an acceptable time frame, although the discharge may have passed by then. Um, if we don't have any hard evidence to, to follow up on, uh, we don't really have anything that we can pursue. So um, they've allowed us this time frame. So after we get the sample results back, then we have become aware potential is a discharge and we need to follow up with subsequent investigations. So what are those investigations? Um, well, there's a, there's a few different ones. <clears throat> Probably one of the easiest and most common is the storm drain network or trunk investigation. 
And basically, uh, we'll have a discharge observed at an outfall, and then we'll just travel up the line to the next drain inlet. And then the next one, is it there? Okay, uh, branch off to the left, is it over here? No, branch off to the right, it's not there. Go up, oh, it's still over here, and now it's gone. So it's somewhere in this area. So you basically just keep going up the line, keep, keep popping manholes and looking to see if you can identify if that discharge is still present in the storm drain to narrow down the neighborhood that it's coming from. It takes a lot of field work, it takes a lot of driving, a lot of man hours. Um, something that might be easier to do if you have some good physical indicators is performing a drainage area investigation, which is essentially the same thing, except you're using your knowledge of the city, you're using maps and you're using storm drain lines to identify where these flows probably originated from to narrow down your investigations in the field. Um, and you could also use this if the discharge is stopped and you can't follow up on on where that came from, but you're still trying to identify the facility, um, this might be a good idea if you have uh, solid physical indicators. So, um, you know, it, the, going back to our example for John Doe, he smelled fermented grapes, and if there isn't a winery around him, there might be one in the neighborhood that is discharging to that storm drain eventually. So he can look on maps, he can look for uh, business licenses around that neighborhood, for something that might match the description of the discharge that he is getting. Uh, if you do have a facility and you want to confirm that there's an illicit connection, sometimes uh, a facility might not be aware that they are actually illegally connected to a storm drain system. Um, we had this situation with a client where they had a, a storm drain that was piped to uh, a facility we were working on. This wasn't for a municipality, it was for an industrial facility. But they were, they were an old property that got bought and separated years ago and have been two separate businesses for forever. Well, they've been sending their stormwater discharge um, over to our facility in our storm drains. And uh, furthermore, they had some floor drains that we suspected had you know, processed water and none of it was piped separately. It was all piped to the storm drain system. So those types of things you can use cameras for to verify pipes uh, that might be illegal or you need to follow up on, or easier is a dye testing, where you put it down the point source and then it flows through the storm drain system and you can find it easily uh, using, using dye. So a couple other things. Um, once the source has been determined, what do you do? Well, you attempt to stop it as soon as possible. Uh, if you can't, if it hasn't stopped already, you try to stop it as soon as possible. And then you determine the size and scope of the pol potential pollutant impact, how long has it been going, how severe are our sample results, um, attempt to locate the responsib responsible party. Uh, sometimes, again, you might know who the responsible party is, so you don't need to locate them. And then develop specific mitigation measures and timelines for the responsible party. That's following an enforcement response plan that you should have an implemented um, and, and developing a notice of correction or a notice of violation. Um, going back out, you need to go back out and verify that things were cleaned up and that the spill or illicit discharge has stopped. Um, then you'll have further enforcement if it's necessary, if they haven't listened. And of course, document everything. Document everything you need. Um, and so what is the required documentation? I'll just go through this quickly. One, you need to provide accurate flow measurements and the duration of the spill and discharge. Some of these might need to be, uh, the duration of the spill might need to be estimated a little bit. You might not have a clear identity, identification of when that started or stopped, but the flow measurements can be pretty accurately uh, predicted um, or determined. Um, you need to provide a map of the problem location with drain inlets and outfalls involved and where the discharge occurred Take photos. I wouldn't even say if possible. We all have smartphones. So take photos of the event, take photos of what you're finding. Um, and then you want to document any actions taken, including people, equipment, and activities, um, the mitigation and cleanup measures taken, record of uh, corrected actions, and then the follow up of field verifications of compliance. So that was a lot of information. And if you want more, you can go to the Center for Water Watershed Protections IDDE manual. Um, a lot of the information we got is from this manual. 
And uh, it's just a helpful tool. And in fact, the MS4 phase two permit points to that saying, go and read this. As well as the, the uh, CASCA b uh, handbook for municipalities, that's also a great resource. So with that, I'm gonna drink some water and we're going to switch to pollution prevention and good housekeeping, our final segment here. <clears throat> so Ben Franklin, I didn't verify this, but I'm hoping this is correct. Ben, ben Franklin said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, that is very accurate, Ben. Um, and along with pollution prevention, along with that idea, I always like to say that uh, pollution prevention BMPs are, are common sense BMPs. Um, these should be pretty apparent, pretty like, oh yeah, you're right. That is pretty, pretty simple to understand. These aren't, you know, big brain topics that you need to, to worry about. These are pretty simple procedures that you can be, that can be implemented. The best pollution prevention starts before the job begins. And why is that? Because it starts with an evaluation of your facility or specific job and its potential to pollute. <clears throat> so you do that by observing the operations at your facility, um, your municipal facility, or on your, uh, on your O&M activity, um, whether it be fueling, washing, um, uh, whatever maintenance work you're doing or material that you're storing. Uh, observe those operations and determine that operations exposure to stormwater first. Um, is, is it a hazardous material that's left out outdoors with no cover and no secondary containment and the barrels left open? open. That's probably something that is exposed to stormwater and needs to be uh, addressed. Um, you need to also understand how your facility's runoff flows and where it leaves the site. Now, that's a misspelling there, sorry. Where it will leave the site. Um, and, and that's just saying, okay, so you have a problem well, where's it gonna go? How do you know where to address it? You need to understand where your flow paths are, where your discharge points are, and where outfalls are, and storm drains. And also identify areas on your job site where water will run off and leave your work area. Again, the discharge point. So you have your facility runoff, and then also on a specific job, if you're working in the right of way, or if you're working um, on the sidewalk, you wanna identify storm drains in that area and which way water is likely to flow off of that job site. So we've identified pollutants. We know that there are problems and uh, we have them in our head. So what do we do about that? Well, we're going to implement our best management practices. And again, there's two types. There are uh, structural and non-structural, or as I like to call them, procedural BMPs. Um, structural BMPs, overhead coverage, secondary containment for barrels or materials, um, inlet protection devices, rock bags, plastic, covering up drains, and then erosion control devices if you're doing soil disturbance. Um, but then you'll have non-structural BMPs like um, uh, schedules, scheduling for, uh, for sweeping or inspections, um, and procedures that you'll have in place for material handling and, and uh, a spill response. All those things could be considered a non-structural BMP. The most important one is, is scheduling. If you can prevent something from being exposed to stormwater, you've taken away the stormwater problem. <clears throat> so let's get into some do's and don'ts of pollution prevention. And this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, we would be exhausted if I did that. Um, but what I am gonna cover is some generic topics that should be applicable to most everybody. And again, these are common sense. These should be pretty straightforward. Don't need to think too hard about that. So what about vehicle and equipment operations? Well, if you're doing maintenance, do as much as possible to do that undercover. Um, if you have a maintenance shop, do your maintenance in the maintenance shop. Uh, if it can be avoided, uh, just bring it back to the shop and do your maintenance indoors undercover where it can't be exposed to stormwater or leave into the conveyance system. If it's unavoidable, unavoidable, do protect the nearby storm drains and try to contain the maintenance as much as possible. <clears throat> you also want to routinely inspect stored vehicles and equipment for leaks and staining. 
um, you want to use drip pans and absorbents uh, to fix those leaks or uh, if to fix those leaks if you find any. Um, and uh, you'll also want to remove them after the equipment is repaired or uh, or before wet weather because what might start out as a good intention for a BMP, um, you know, you put a drip pan underneath a, a leaking a leaking backhoe and then it rains the next day and all that oil just ran off into the storm drain anyway. So always follow up, always uh, go back to find your uh, pollutant prevention BMPs. For washing activities, these are pretty common or common sense. Don't wash vehicles or equipment near storm drains or other storm water conveyance areas. Uh, hopefully your corp yard or uh, whatever municipality you're working for, they have a wash rack or a designated wash area where you can do your washing. So if, you, if possible, avoid washing into the street, into the conveyance system, and obviously don't wash oily parts or other you know, potentially contaminated debris onto impervious surfaces where it can flow to a storm drain. For fueling, do identify storm drains in the fueling area. Uh, make sure you have adequate spill kits present and that they're clearly labeled. Um, nobody likes if a spill happens and uh, somebody turns to you and says, hey, get the spill supplies. And then you're looking all around and you can't find the bucket where the spill supplies are kept because it's not marked. Um, or as I found, the, the bucket was open a little bit and they all got soaked with water and there is three feet of standing water in one of our, our buckets. So you'll also want to routinely inspect and restock spill supplies as needed. Um, don't provide employees with access to the fueling area without proper training on appropriate spill response protocols. Um, when I did landscaping, I'm going to out myself here a little bit. When I used to do landscaping in high school, uh, we would fuel all of our lawnmowers and hedge trimmers and all that. We'd fuel it in, in the street, on the sidewalk, wherever. and uh, uh, for a young high school kid, a, a five gallon gas can is a little bit too heavy for me and spills would happen all the time, but nobody ever trained me to clean them up and they just evaporated and I thought, oh, that's fine. Uh, and so very likely if you don't train your employees on proper spill, uh, spill response, they're not going to know to do it either. So make sure employees have uh, spill response training before they're allowed to fuel. Um, and also routinely inspect, especially prior to rain events, for drips or stains that need to be addressed. What about right-of-way maintenance or road work? Um, well, do berm the work area if runoff is a potential. I can't tell you how many times uh, there was a simple water main uh, maintenance issue and the whole street got flooded because somebody nicked the wrong pipe or the water wasn't turned off all the way or something leaked and now they have to dewater. Um, if you are working with where runoff is a potential or dewatering is potential, make sure your work area is bermed, make sure the storm drains are protected. Um, that also goes for uh, during sidewalk repairs, paving or uh, street painting. Um, and also when you're out in the field, make sure you still have spill supplies readily available. You don't want to have to run back to your to your corp yard to pick up spill supplies uh, to address a spill that should have been addressed immediately. <clears throat> Some other right, right of way maintenance tips. Uh, don't store materials that could spill or cause pollution in the street or gutters. I forgot to put the picture in here, but uh, I had a, a picture of somebody that did a concrete washout and it wasn't a municipality, it was a contractor, but I wanted to point out that they uh, they had a washout, but then they washed out on the dirt next to the washout. And then not only that, but they also washed out in the street in front of the washout um, that was uh, located conveniently on the sidewalk. Um, so it caused a big source of pollution um, and it didn't need to happen if they just had some proper training. So try to keep stuff away from streets, sidewalks and gutters if possible. I know that's not always possible, but that's just a good practice if you can. And then again, wash vehicles and equipment and fuel them um, at the corp yard or a designated area rather than in the field. Um, and obviously, don't leave soil disturbed to stormwater when possible. Um, if you're repairing a piece of sidewalk, um, put an erosion control material on top of it so you don't have disturbed soil exposed to stormwater. Trash and recycling bins. 
Um, people don't always like this one, uh, get a lot of complaints about this, but keep the bins covered when they're not being used um, and inspect them regularly so that they are in good shape and free of leaks. And also make sure that they are secured so that only authorized personnel have access. Um, the last thing you want is somebody to try and dump something into your, uh, into your trash bin illegally and then you have a potential problem that you didn't want on your hands. Um, and also you want to inspect them for uh, this very reason. Look at this picture down here and all that fun orange water that's nasty looking. Well, these are the same trash bins and uh, uh, this is improper disposal of materials. And so the street sweeper came by and he dumped his sweepings and there was water in there and other liquid which was usually fine for that bin, um, but somebody had put some other chemicals and other stuff in there and uh, it overflowed and leaked and spilled out. And uh, the trash can probably should have been maintained and replaced. Um, and so now you have a potential leak and uh, hazardous material leaving the trash container into the storm drain. So um, don't put oily parts debris, uh, don't put, uh, uh, liquids or chemicals in there, only put trash in the trash bin and uh, we should be good. And then contract BMPs, again, how do you, uh, they should be the ones implementing this. And, uh, and if they have been doing this for long enough, they should be aware of needing to implement uh, best management practices. But how do you convey expectations? Well, you do it through contract language. Uh, if that hasn't been updated, it should be. Um, just verbal discussions, just talking to them what you expect, pre-job walks and job inspections, and then uh, facility signage, making sure that you know who was doing a job so they can be held responsible if they did it wrong. And so what happens if you do have a spill? Let's talk about containment and cleanup uh, briefly here. Um, and these are just general guidelines, but for small spills and discharges, uh, just use a rag or a damp cloth and absorbent material as needed for general cleanup. And then uh, use brooms or shovels uh, for absorbent materials after you need to pick them up. If you need to use water, uh, make sure it's collected and properly disposed of um, because wash water can't, you can't just wash it down in the storm drain. Um, and then dispose of any waste material and equipment that was used to clean up the material properly. Uh, don't throw it into that trash bin where it didn't belong. Uh, for large non-hazardous spills and discharges, uh, you'll want to go to absorbent materials and booms, so your kitty litter and, and oil booms for your cleanup. And then again, uh, the tools, maybe a street sweeper if necessary for the cleanup of the dry materials. Again, if water is used, it needs to be collected and properly disposed of. You can't allow that into the storm drain. And as before, you dispose of the waste materials properly. So what about a large spill or hazardous spill? Well, remember, as we said before, um, any, any, any immediate threat to human health or adverse effect to the environment needs to be reported to the local health department immediately. And then there's a few other uh, people you'll need to contact, maybe go and review your spill plan, maybe go and review your uh, IDDE cards uh, to see who you need to contact and if those contacts are up to date. Uh, but the, generally, uh, you don't want to be addressing large spills or hazardous spills. Um, a private cleanup company will need to come in or maybe a hazmat team to assess the situation and conduct the cleanup and disposal of the materials. And again, if the spilled material is hazardous, it needs to be treated as such. And uh, it needs to be disposed of as a hazardous material, as well as all the equipment used in the cleanup. So again, just to reiterate, pollution prevention starts and ends with you. Uh, remember, it's, it's super simple. Just observe what you're doing. Just take a moment to observe what you're doing and what activity you're doing and uh, uh, what the exposure is to stormwater. And if something was to happen, where is that water going to go? How is it going to leave your site? How is it going to discharge? Um, and then address BMPs from that. So again, there's a couple of guides here. The CASCA BMP Handbook for Municipalities. It's great to go through. They have all these different activities in there um, and you can, you can go check on it for there as well as Center for Watershed Protection. They have uh, uh, pollution prevention manuals as well. You can check those out.
So with that, we can get into some questions. We've got about five or so minutes. And I see I have a question here from Mel, who says, uh, for say work on a sidewalk and gutter that is downhill of a residential area, and there is rain in the forecast, I would want to divert the water in the gutter above my project around the disturbed soil area materials. Does the MS4 require any additional documentation for this clear water diversion that is not coming in contact with construction and is still ending up in the same storm drain? That's a great question. That's, a, that's also a great, uh, a great idea, Mel. Um, and my answer would be if you are doing, if you're disturbing soil, even if it is a municipal activity, it should still have an erosion sediment control plan, which says specifically how you are going to address uh, stormwater and run on and run off from your site. Um, so if you, if you aren't using erosion sediment control plans for those types of activities, I'd recommend it. Um, that would be the only other additional documentation I would, I would uh, suggest. I wouldn't call it a clear water diversion uh, because that's technically for in water work. That's more of just controlling the runout on your project. Um, so yeah, you can berm around it with, with rock bags so that uh, water is diverted around it and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't enter onto your construction site. So great idea, um, great question. Do you have any more questions? Give it a couple minutes. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want to just, if it's easier to just uh, talk instead of type. If you want to unmute yourself or ask another question. Going once, going twice. All right. Well, thank you guys for, for coming. And uh, if I didn't answer a question you wanted, you can feel free to call me or email me. I'm always happy to help. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. And I hope you enjoyed this broadcast. And uh, we will also have another one for erosion sediment control plans uh, in about a half hour. So if you're coming back, hope to see you then. Thank you.